All right, welcome to week four of mixing and mastering. We're going to talk about such a interesting tool. Um, you know, I thought we got a lot out of EQ, but together EQ and compression, you've got in these two steps um, such a wide amount of control over, um, you know, really laying down a great foundation or the foundations for a really great mix. Um, I want to thank uh, Robert and Dante for their presentations. I'm going to try to sidestep the information that they presented and kind of work around that. There, of course, will be some overlap, so you'll just have to, um, you know, be patient on that. Um, so I want to make sure, you know, to hit these topic points, talk a little bit about where compression came from and, the, you know, in doing so, answer the, the question of why do we even have this? Um, then, of course, you know, how they work um and the uh the kind of sound that comes as a result of this um this tool we have and then looking at the the most typical ways that you would be expected to um to use the instrument and so these don't include um some of the more creative or artistic ways where um you know i think in current popular music compressors are being really pushed to the limit to create um, some sounds that are not necessarily natural, but they are unique. Um, and so those are, are good to know about. For my purposes, I want to make sure that you guys have the sound foundation of, um, and by sound I mean, um, you know, stable and um, functional um, in terms of the basic applications. Uh, there are a few tricks, I think, that um, you know, are obviously useful, especially when you do the, um, the kind of work on making kick and bass guitar work together. So making room and the EQ spectrum, and then we can review a few definitions at the end. So just in terms of the history, you know, um, in the 1920s, we have this new, you know, entertainment, uh, uh, medium called radio, which is an audio only um, medium of reaching, um, you know, mass audiences and the early equipment, um, could sustain, you know, catastrophic damage due to spikes in, in volume and gain and, and loudness. And so, um, while those, uh, terms are technically, um, distinct with some overlap, the general idea is that if the, um, if the audio is too powerful, then it can damage the uh, the transmitters and you know cause the radio station to go offline for a certain amount of time, um, you know depending on how fast the choo choo train is going to make it with the the new part or the horseback. <laughs> Trying to think of what life is like in the 1920s. Um, you got cars. I mean things can get around. Anyway, um, and so you know the obvious way to deal with that at the time is you just turn it down by hand, but you know, over a certain amount of, you know, months, weeks, years, however long that's going to get a little old. And so having an automatic, um, gain reduction system was critical and that's kind of where compression comes from. And so some of the early, um, compressors, you know, used electron tubes, they're referred to as variable moo. They don't let you, allow you to adjust, you know, what's referred to as the threshold, um, and, you know, these devices also could be, um, turned up like one of the controls, uh, which is the ratio. If you turn it up all of the way to where, you know, um, you have an infinite amount of compression, then it simply is a hard limiter, meaning it won't let that signal go past the, you know, the threshold, which is, um, basically where the compressor starts to do its job. So we'll go over some of those terms in the um, uh, subsequent slides of the present. So as technology develops, um, there are distinct differences between the old school analog compressors and the new digital compressors, um, digital giving enough sort of exact um, control that you start to lose some of the, you know, um, character, I guess it's associated with the analog compressors. That's essentially tied to the fact that they are less exact. And, um, 
some of the gold standard compressors like the um, LA-2A compressor or the 1176 are both recognized uh, and, you know, can be thousands of dollars but are in fact less exact um, than a digital plug-in compressor that you can use uh, with your Pro Tools bundle. Um, so some of the types of different compressors that you'll find, we talked about active um, or fixed versus variable threshold. Usually a good compressor will allow you to move the threshold around and that once again is the um, amount of decibels, uh, so the amount of loudness that the compressor is going to start kind of focusing at that point and above. Um, but some, you know, an active compressor is one that you'll actually need to, um, you know, turn on and is going to be fed, uh, you know, operated with uh, electricity. But there are passive com uh, compressors like the 1176 that simply um, work on sound as it passes through and um, are sort of like a, um, a DI or something like that. Um, or a volume control. So these are examples of passive circuits. Um, so you've got, uh, you know, how to understand the way a compre the way compression works. You know, I I like the metaphor that the text use, which is it's like the gravity uh, pull of um, of sound. And so uh, a compressor is going to make it harder for sound to um, to become louder as you turn the ratio up. And so, um, you know, the one-to-one -one setting uh, is basically no compression at all. That's kind of like unity gain for, um, uh, for EQ. So there's, there's really nothing that's happening. But when you put it at two-to-one, it requires, you know, twice the, um, the sound energy to go one decibel higher. And so, three to one, four to one, five to one, etc., cetera, um, until you get to infinity to one, which is it doesn't matter how much energy you apply, the compressor is going to hold, or in that case, it's acting as a limiter, is going to hold um, that level steady. Um, and so let's move on now and take a look at the 1176. So you'll see here there is no threshold setting. Um, you can adjust the amount of gain coming in with the input, um, the makeup gain, since you're actually, um, the work of the compressor is going to result uh, in making the sound quieter or more kind of um, having a hard time reaching the peaks of volume that it did. Um, it's common for compressors to have a, an amplifier included, um, and that is what the output knob there uh, refers to. So that's the makeup gain. Um, attack and release, these are time sensitive. Uh, we'll talk about them in a little bit, but you know, for uh, percussive sounds, the uh, attack is very fast on that. So when you hit a drum um, snare with a stick, you know, that attack happens within, you know, um, in, within milliseconds. And so you'll need the attack on the compressor to mirror that or else you won't be able to, you know, focus on on that early part of the sound envelope, and the release, you know, is how long the compressor is going to hold on to that sound event before it it lets go. Um, and so those are time, kind of time sensitive knobs, the attack and the release, basically indicating at what point in within the envelope, um, you know, from attack to decay, sustain, and release, you know, that ADSR. Um, equation or, um, you know, what is that? That's a, um, there's a word for combinations of letters that I'll refer to words, but anyway. Um, so you can also see that, <clears throat> you know, the 1176 has fixed thresholds like many do, but these are just push buttons. So there is no three to one, which is a common starting point, but instead you go four to one is the lightest. So the 1176 is going to be a pretty powerful compressor. Um, it doesn't give you hard limiting, so it stops at 20 to one, um, but that's still a ton of compression. Um, the meter can work with actual sound that goes, um, you know, a typical meter is going to be at rest on the left-hand side, and then as sound goes through, it'll show you how loud the sound is, and so that's plus four, 
and plus eight. Um, but if you press GR, that's gain reduction and it does the opposite. So it goes to rest on the right hand side when nothing is happening. And then when the needle moves, it shows you how much of that signal the, um, the compressor is basically compressing or working on. And so that can be confusing to students when you press GR and the needle looks like it's wide open going all the way to the right hand side, but that's in fact where it's resting. So that's, you know, um, zero dB, um, not by the meter, but by the compressor's sensitivity controls because 100% gain is zero dB. But anyway, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what you need to know there. Um, so there are some secondary, those are the primary controls. The secondary controls um, would be like adjusting the knee. And so for a, um, a sudden loud transient, um, you know, a hard knee is the appropriate response to that. Typically, you know, always let your ears be your guide. Um, but if you want the work of the trans uh, compressor to be more transparent, like for example, um, when dealing with a voice, um, you don't really want to show uh, your hand there and the fact that you're using this tool, um, you know, to adjust the voice, um, it's best for voice to sound natural 90% uh, of the time, but I'm sure there are situations where, you know, like in heavily distorted or very aggressive forms of music, like for example, you know, death metal, you know, ha having a, a heavy compression to the voice, um, I think would be a good fit there, whether or not you use hard or soft knee would definitely be a, um, you know, a matter of your, um, you know, that's kind of uh, season to taste, I guess is what I'm saying there. So when it sounds good to your ear, you know, you have an artistic license here to do what you need to. Um, so in terms of like this, what this compression sounds like, even though it is um, smashing or making it harder for sound to be loud, I guess you could say, the sound of compression typically is bigger, more dense, more fat. You kind of can hear the interior details of a given sound that you're compressing. So it's kind of punchy, but it also has less dynamic range. So you're reducing the amount of distance from um, and distance in terms of vertical distance or decibels from the highest peak to the lowest valley. And so when you look at this chart on the right here, you see the dotted line. Um, that is the threshold. So the when the dotted line is set low like that, you're not just working on the peaks, but you're working on everything above the dotted line. And so that's you know in this case 80% of the um, of the available waveform. And so when you compress 80% of the waveform down from in this case 5 dB to 3 dB, if you're looking at you know the difference between A and B there in the lower picture then you use the makeup gain to uh, put to put the new waveform back up to five where it started you can see how thick that new waveform is compared to the um, uh, the first one where uh, so much of the uh, gain was really limited in that sort of attack and decay now you've got a lot of your decibel, um, a lot of the energy is um, distributed more evenly between, you know, the sustain and release, the additional parts of the envelope. And so you've just got a more substantial waveform there. And so that's where you get this kind of denser, fatter, stronger, punchier. Those are the kinds of terms that are associated with um, effective compression. So to review kind of how it works, you know, you've got a copy of the signal that comes into the system or the signal comes into the, to the um, uh, component, the compressor, and uh, a copy is made. And then the threshold identifies, you know, how much of that waveform it's going to work on. And then any of the sound energy above that threshold is isolated. And then that's where the compressor goes to work. And so um, to see that, uh, and then after the it compresses, it reinserts that, um, you know, it's work, right? The process of compression back onto, it maps it back onto the original signal, usually um, creating a, a modified envelope. And so um, this is a visual representation of that. So A at the top shows, you know, um, the signal coming in. B uh, is you're setting the threshold. 
and um, everything above that becomes what's in uh, C there. So it's just those two blocks. Uh, and then in D, you're going to cut one of them off because it's a two to one ratio. Um, and so two to one basically means that you're you know taking one half as opposed to a third and a, um, or, or three quarters, et cetera, as you compress more and more. Um, and then you sculpt it with the attack and the release. And so that shape, that wave shape there in uh, picture number E uh, or letter E is um, basically, you know, one millisecond for it to go from zero compression to full compression. And so because that chart reads left to right in terms of time, um, that's why you're getting, you know, from zero to a hundred percent over a millisecond is going to curve it like that. And then when it releases, you're going to get the same curve, just the reverse shape of it. And so, um, and then finally, when you get to F, um, the compressor is inverting, you know, using phase to, uh, turn it from a positive to a negative, um, energy event and so it's no longer read as a boost in the signal it's read as a cut and so when you reapply that um, that new waveform over the existing signal it cuts it in a very specific way and so that's basically what what happens there um, so typical practice you're just really containing your um, your mix in a way and so to see what that looks like you know, um, if you have vocal, snare, and bass in picture A above here that are kind of a complete jumble and you need to vertically arrange your mix to keep the, um, the snare under control so that the vocals can ride on top like they're supposed to, you can use a compressor uh, in that way to, you know, even out the vocals and then boost the average, you know, level of that. And then for the snare, you even out that and um, you don't use the makeup gain to boost it up. You just kind of cut it. Um, you know, you compress the, the peaks and then let them stay low. Um, so that's a way to do that. Um, hold on a second. Oh, that's a drag. I can't go backwards. Yes, I can. No, I can't. All right. Um, so a couple of the ways that, um, you know, you can use or the, the standard ways I mentioned um, containing the tracks that's the one at the bottom you can also you know reshape if you want to um, emphasize the decay for example then you compress the attack and then raise the makeup gain and the decay sounds louder because that's the part that's not emphasized um, but if you want to do the opposite and emphasize the attack you just simply compress the backside of the envelope and then um, raise the makeup gain and boom now you've got a really sort of more impressive attack uh, of the first part of that sound event. Um, and so balancing, loudening is bringing that kind of punchiness and making something more present and massive in the mix. Um, and so, uh, you know, these are basic techniques for using compression. And so you can read more about those um, as you want to. Um, you know, parallel compression and external side chain. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about external side chain. There are two different forms of side chain compression. One is triggered by um, parallel, um, I'm sorry, the two types of uh, side chain compression being um, just based on EQ. And then what's referred to as external side chain compression. And so uh, we work with the one that ha that's based on EQ, um, which is to basically carve out your uh, area of compression and allow for um, another instrument that's in proximity in EQ to uh, have more space. Um, external side chain compression, however, is when you use, um, this is an, sort of a more advanced trick, but you can plug in another instrument into your compressor, and whenever that instrument, um, you know, um, imagine that we're compressing um, bass guitar. And so if you bring your kick drum into the, your bass guitar side chain, I'm sorry, external side chain 
routing, then um, it will the compressor will read the performance of the kick drum, and whenever it reaches a uh, you know a threshold of loudness, then it will trigger the compression of the bass to not sort of get in its way. Um, and so it's a very versatile, typically a very versatile um, tool to have access to. Um, for more information on external side tr side chain compression, uh, I do recommend that you um, consult the textbook. Here are um, page numbers for some of the different uh, topics and terms that are specific to compression that are um, a little bit, um, you know, can be difficult to, um, I guess that you just don't hear. So it's specialized terms you don't hear very often. And so there they are. And um, I do ask you to send questions as necessary and enjoy the class. Take care.